Hello, STEM Nation. Jeff here, and welcome to episode number 51 of STEM on Fire, where we interview practicing professionals in the area of science, technology, engineering, and math to help guide students interested in STEM careers. If you like what you hear, please share it with a friend. Now let's get fired up with our guest, Dr. Durant, and I hope our chat will help ignite your passion towards a STEM career. Dr. Durant earned his undergrad in electrical and computer engineering from the Milwaukee School of Engineering, MSOE, and his master's and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan back in 2002, diving into genetic algorithms for hearing aids, and in the summer is a DSP researcher at Starkey Hearing Technologies in Minnesota, and is also a professor at MSOE. Along with his PhD, he also earned his MBA from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2011. Welcome to the show, Dr. Durant. Fill in any gaps and share a bit of your personal life. Uh, it's great to be with you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, you covered it very well. Um, I, I uh, have been interested in the areas of computers and technology uh, since uh, since I was a kid and did a lot with it through high school. Um, some of my personal interests that uh, have an interesting technology tie-in are photography. I do a lot of digital photography of sports and theater, and that has a nice tie-in between the technology side and the artistic side, and uh, I read a lot. I'm in a number of book clubs. Awesome. Thanks for that background, Dr. Durant. And let's dive right in here. So you've got a PhD, and you went from your undergrad straight through to your master's right into your PhD. So did you know coming out of high school that, yes, I'm going to be a PhD, I'm going to be a college professor, or did that that come about while you're in college? Uh, it came about when I was in college, Jeff. I, I um, didn't really know what, what a PhD was, but I, uh, in, in college, I uh, got introduced to some topics in the electrical engineering side. For me, it was digital signal processing and really dove into that as an elective. And, uh, and, and then kind of on the path to that with some of my professors in, in college, learned that that was a path I could, if I wanted to, do a lot more on by going to graduate school. Okay, so Dr. Durant, so you got your undergrad at MSOE, and then you went on to a different school, University of Michigan, to get your master's and PhD. Could you stay at one school and get your your undergrad, master's, and PhD, or is it recommended to go to different schools for the various degrees? The normal recommendation is to go to different schools, and some schools, uh, do, like MSOE, do not have PhD programs. Their focus is 99%, uh, 90% on the undergraduate teaching, and we have some master's degrees. But if you go to a PhD granting institution um, as an undergrad, some people do stay on for bachelor's, master's, PhD. But I, I agree with the advice that uh, a, a, a lot of people generally give uh, undergrad students, which is you get a benefit by seeing how different universities do things. The culture is a little different. The, the research programs are different. Um, by having that variety, you, you learn more than staying in the same uh, academic environment for all three degrees. But some yeah. people do it. Some people do it very successfully. So it's not, there's no law against it. All right. So it sounds like STEM Nation, you have the opportunity to kind of hang out at the same school or, or go try some different schools if you want to head on to your master's or PhD. And so, Dr. Durant, you've got your PhD in, in DSP processing, and you're a professor at MSOE, and it looks like you kind of became a professor as soon as you've got your PhD or, or you started teaching. But you also, during the summer, you, you, you do other jobs. Could you delve into how that's possible to be a professor and also work in the commercial world? Absolutely. Um, when I was finishing up the PhD. I was thinking about going into industrial research positions uh, in digital signal processing. And about a year before I finished that, um, one of my mentors from my undergraduate degree uh, uh, had lunch with me and uh, he encouraged me to consider teaching as a career. And there were a number of great things about it he mentioned. He said, this is one of the things that one of the doors your PhD is opening for you. But one of the things he said was, as a professor, in the summers, you generally aren't teaching. You have freedom to go pursue another project, to go do consulting, uh, to 
to develop new courses for the university if that's what you want to do. And that ability to regularly shift gears and get my mind into a, a different place and keep growing really appealed to me. MSOE has a very good track record. Is is MSOE a, a, a teaching institution, a research institution, or, or both? Because some universities are you know, just deep research universities. Well, it's first and foremost, it's a teaching institution, and uh, we do research, but it's not the emphasis that you would find at it, what's called an R1 or a research one or a large research university. What that means is some of our faculty, a number, certainly do have research. They do um, some during the year, some during the summers, but, but most of our time, the vast majority, especially during the academic year, is spent um, developing and teaching classes and teaching labs for our undergraduate students. And uh, that, mo that model has some advantages. Uh, it, it keeps all the faculty very focused on serving the undergraduate students. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different model than you'll find at the, at the large research universities. We, we each have our, our advantages. And I, I always encourage students when they visit the universities and high schools through open houses and whatnot that they ask about those advantages and think about what's the best fit for how they envision themselves as a student learning. Thanks for that, Dr. Durant and STEM Nation. Yeah, take a look at the universities that you're looking at attending and, and think about what you want to do. And if you want to go to a, a true research school where there's just deep dive research or go to one that's, I'll say, more focused on the education and not as much research. So let's just take a look at that and make sure you're making the right choices. And Dr. Durant, with a Ph.D., does the Ph.D. close any doors because you've been so specific in a, in a research area? Boy, that's that's a tough question. I, I, I think, frankly, in practice, it probably does. Um it certainly doesn't unqualify you for something, but uh, with with that degree, there's uh, an, an expectation of the people who are hiring you that there's a match between your experience and your degree, and um, so there, there's you know certain lower level work, uh, kind of the, the first layers uh, of the, the design. You, you, you might not be considered for that. But now I will say, although it, it, it maybe closes some of those positions, it also opens a lot more. And it's really interesting to look at how low the unemployment data for engineers with any degree has been. But the unemployment rate actually goes down with the higher degrees which means there's a lot of demand for what PhDs can do, even though some doors are closed. Yeah, that's some great insight, Dr. Durant. And let's dig in here. What is your specific area of expertise? Within digital signal processing, I have done um, worked in a few areas. Uh, I've done a lot in, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, genetic algorithms, which is a form of artificial intelligence that um, where the uh, system uh, learns from the environment and you have this what we call online feedback where uh, based on what's happening in the environment the system is continually learning and improving a and uh, I've also done a lot with uh, adaptive signal processing in a, an area called convex optimization which uh, is a really neat combination of uh, mathematics brought into engineering practice. So for someone who uh, loves math or loves solving puzzles and seeing how pieces fit together in very elegant ways, uh, we can do um, uh, some things uh, with algorithms. For example, one of them is beam forming, where uh, there's, there's many versions of this. You may have heard of it as a feature on cell phones uh, with Wi-Fi and uh, cellular antennas. But it's also used in audio processing, which is my area. And with uh, a few microphones, uh, two or three or maybe many in some systems, uh, you can uh, do some amazing things by focusing the, the direction you're listening on very tightly and uh, drowning out interferences. And it's all based on, on the math. So th those are some of the areas I've worked in. More recently, over the last two years, 
I've been delving into uh, deep learning, which is the dominant uh, artificial intelligence uh, AI technology today, and working on some audio applications of that. So deep learning, what does that mean by deep learning? Deep learning refers to um, something called a deep neural network. And uh, first of all, uh, what, what a neural network is, is it is a uh, algorithm, a mathematical structure on a computer for learning and inferencing. So learning and then applying what you what, what the system learned to solve a problem. And what, what this class of artificial intelligence algorithms uh, ha have, in, have in common, which is related to what I said before, is they're, they're empirically based, which means they look at, you have to give them lots of data from what happens in the real world um, and show them uh, what the pattern is. And then from, from what you observed, how you should act when you observe that for your particular problem. Now, I learned about this back in college uh, well over 20 years ago, um, the, and um, we learned about the algorithms, and at that time, they really, the, the uh, field hadn't gone very far with them. They ran into some major roadblocks. And then, um, after I graduated college, this is going back, oh, maybe over 10 years now, over 10 years now, there were some breakthroughs in uh, training these deep networks and, and the deep network means it goes through multiple layers. So the idea is if you think about, um, how, uh, the human visual system works, your, some photons come into your eye, they hit the retina. Um, and there is this pattern of activation where you, where there's different colors in different areas, but then that goes through the brain and your brain starts recognizing dark and light and edges and lines. And then we go a little farther and you realize, oh, this is an object. And there's different parts of the brain in this deep network with multiple layers that are recognizing those things. And it, it gets more interesting than that, but that's, that's a good first pass description. Well, we want our computer-based learning algorithms to be able to have multiple layers like that, to do some really more powerful things than we could do 20 or 30 years ago. So, uh, so, so that's what that's what a deep network is, and deep learning is the training and, and how you develop those deep networks. And really, the the research has uh, really taken off and figured out how to do those networks well, which was something that was not known 25 years ago. It was a uh, it was uh, considered a difficult problem at the time. This is why today um, you can talk to your cell phone and it understands what you're saying. That's a, one of the big applications of deep learning, and there are many more coming down the pipeline. It's the hot thing right now. Yeah, and STEM Nation, um, you know, kind of what Dr. Durant is talking about is the compute power available 10 years ago wasn't there to do these deep neural networks, and today it is. And the amount of processing power continues to increase with Moore's law, although we're we're hitting some some head roads there. But you know we're finding ways to solve Moore's law and keep it running. Absolutely. Um, so thanks for that, Dr. Durant. And we're going to get even more specific. And what is one thing that really has you fired up about DSP or audio processing? And where do you see it headed? I am excited that we we've come to a point where we're seeing the, the deep learning and artificial intelligence as a more general purpose engineering tool. And this is informing audio processing and digital signal processing. And it's it's going to impact tons of areas throughout engineering and uh, numerous products. Um, but but what, it, what it means is for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, depending on what level of system you want to look at, we've been doing some pretty amazing things with signal processing learning how to remove noise from signals and focus on a particular direction and help people hear better and have very good television reception from weak signals. And, and that technology is also what allows the global positioning system, the GPS, to work so well um, with very low power from satellites in orbit, but, but your chief device on the ground can tell where it is. But, but what I'm excited about is with the deep learning and the artificial intelligence, it says we have a whole new uh, area we can push into um, 
in these other application areas. And the, the, the truth is, in, in a lot of the application areas, including audio processing and so on, the improvements have become smaller and more incremental. And we, we, we've learned a lot about the statistics behind it, and um, we've pushed and we've optimized that, but it's kind of, some of the approaches are kind of running into a limit. Well, being able to take an AI-based approach and say, in addition to having this structural inductive understanding of what goes on when you describe a system, how input maps to output in a very detailed level, you can supplement that by a, a, a system that learns what the useful patterns in real life are. And whether that uh, means um, learning what uh, clean and clear audio uh, sounds like relative to noisy audio, uh, or uh, cleaning up images and removing noise and artifacts from them, as a lot of companies are going public with their innovations on right now. Um, the, the deep learning uh, is an application area that is going to impact not just my area of engineering, but but, I, but all of them in the coming years. Thanks, Dr. Grant, for that great overview and insights in STEM Nation. Yeah, take a look at AI, deep learning, uh, if you're heading off into college. And we're going to change gears here a bit. Could you take us to a moment in time of an incredible aha moment you've had, Dr. Durant, and how you turn that aha moment into success? I, I've, I've had a few. Um, one, one I think back to at the start of my, my sophomore year of college, um, I, I remember working uh, you know, many hours on an embedded systems development lab. This is when we were first learning um, the assembly language to tell the, the computer hardware at a very low level what to do step by step. And I thought I understood um, the concepts, but my program wasn't working. And the, the aha moment I had was, I, as I was learning my debugging skills, how you break any problem you have, um, you know, the, the outcome is it's not working, I think it should be working. Well, how do I break it, whatever it is, into two or more pieces so I can figure out which one has the problem? And that's that's the, the general approach to how you debug or figure out why something isn't working the way you designed it. And I went on for hours and hours, and I was getting frustrated, but I was motivated. It was like solving a puzzle. And then eventually I got to the point where I, I realized what was the one small thing I did wrong and what did it mean? Uh, and, uh, and, and that was one of my very technical aha moments. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's an exciting one. And I see that with my students in the laboratory a lot of times where they're working hard, they're engaged, but something isn't working right. And then all of a sudden they figure out what's really going on and, and then everything's working. It's a very powerful moment. These STEM careers are about how to solve problems, and it teaches you how to think, and it teaches you how to solve problems, and that's the what you learn going through college. And as you as you delve into your expertise, develop that expertise once you graduate and get into your career, um, that's where you develop the expertise. But really, college, in my opinion, is is about solving problems and how to do it, and stick to it and develop that grit. Absolutely. Speaking of that, Dr. Durant, you know, STEM Nation is geared towards juniors, seniors, and high school heading off to, to STEM careers, and these careers are challenging, right? You spent hours and hours trying to figure out something, and it ended up being something very, very tiny. Yes. What is some advice you'd give to these 18-year-olds heading off to college so they can be successful in these STEM careers? Uh, well, along the lines of the situation I just described, um, you know, t uh, take a break when, when it's not going anywhere. Uh, go, go let your mind do something else. All, all, all the research on how we learn um, tells us that that's a good thing to do. Come back to the problem an hour later or tomorrow if you can. Um, if, if you're stuck for a, a long period, uh, ask a friend. Uh, ask um, someone who knows something about it. If, you, if it's something you're doing in school, uh, ask a faculty member what they think. And not that they're going to solve your problem, but but they may think about it a different way and get you going in a different direction. So seek those breaks. Um, and, and I think that's a way to, you know, help you maintain your interest in uh, even when something gets tough. Yeah, Dr. Durant, what you're getting at too, I think, is since you may not be able to solve that problem right away, don't do your homework right before it's due. 
start it ahead of time in case you get stuck. You got time to think. You got time to ask questions so you can get it done in time. And we're going to take a quick pause and thank our sponsor, Audible, who's offering a free audiobook. You can head over to stemonfirebook.com. That's stemonfirebook.com to get a free audiobook of your choosing. If you decide to cancel within 30 days, there's no cost and you keep the audiobook. And it is lightning round time. Dr. Durant, are you ready? I am. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Think outside the box, try new things. And a personal habit that contributes to your success. I shift a lot between very tight laser focus and also being able to break out of that and um, think of new ways and outside of the box. So interrupt yourself, be aware of when you're being very fo tightly focused or when you're being creative and consciously try to switch between those modes. And a favorite internet resource or phone app. I love Feedly. I follow a ton of uh, RSS news feeds. Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. And a book that you would recommend? I recently finished reading a book that came out last year called Why We Sleep. And it's uh, all about the history um, and, and what scientists have learned um, about all different sorts of organisms and the, the, the need for sleep and what it does for the, the human body, what it does in various animals. And uh, I just love that um, uh, genre of applied science with scientists explaining their work to me. So that, that's a good one in that, in that grouping. And Dr. Durant, as we wrap up here, you've provided tons of value so far, but we're going to ask for one more as a parting piece of guidance for STEM Nation. And then we will say goodbye. Try to do what you love. As, as an engineer, um, that, that's my greatest gift uh, every day is I can work in a field on something that is useful and I find exciting. So uh, find what that is for you. Thanks, Dr. Durant. And with that, we will say goodbye. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed our chat today with Dr. Durant. Head over to stemonfire.com. Subscribe to the email list to keep up the latest happenings. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast player. And please share it with a friend. Tune in next week where we talk with Will, who is a power engineer. Until next time, I hope this chat has helped ignite your passion 